First things first, Josh. Yeah. How are you? I am super. Really good. Feeling great. That's very good to hear. So um, I kind of want to dive straight into to, uh, to it. But I want to focus on songwriting a little mm -hmm. bit. So when you started songwriting, age 16, 17, you discovered Bob Dylan and, yeah. and artists like him. Yeah. Uh, what did songwriting do for you? What did it allow you to do? At that point, I feel like when we're all 16 or 17, 15, we are like uh, a big mysterious present to ourselves, you know? We're just a big wrapped up present. We don't know what's inside of us, you know? And if we're lucky, someone comes along and pulls the bow and, and, and we find out what's in there. And for me, for me that moment was listening to Johnny Cash and Bob Dylan sing a song. For some people that was listening to hearing Nirvana for the first time or the Sex Pistols. You know, it was somebody suddenly speaking in a language that was meant for you, that you understood. And I held that and I felt like this is a secret. This is my secret. I understand this. Uh, and it, it, it made me, it made, it made me uh, hungry, you know, to describe experiences and to try and exp explain my own way of thinking in, in a new way, which was songwriting, which was, which, which was finding out what you want to say and then making it rhyme and fit in a small package. And a, and a, like a, a lyric is like a little pill that you can carry around with you in your head. And when, when you need it, when you need a way to understand the world, that comes back to you. So I always have felt that songs for me were a lens to see the world and to understand my own experiences. And I discovered that when I was like 16. And I was very lucky for that, you know, because it's given me a shape to my life. Sure. And had you tried to kind of put, put your thoughts uh, into words or to, to try to make a sense of it before uh, kind of songwriting? I had glimmers of that. You know, I, 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 I was a huge reader and, and words were very powerful to me. And I started to realize in high school that words were maybe more powerful to, to me than they were to some of my friends. The words had, had something that, 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 uh, that um, gave me an identity, you know, while my friends were, you know, making the basketball team and playing football and like being cool and like, and, you know, going out and, 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 you know, drinking beer at night and stuff like that. And I was sitting in my room trying to figure out how to write a song, you know, it was something that felt very uh, close. But, but, but before that, it was, you know, it was uh, glimmers like hearing Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds for the first time. Or, or learning that I could, uh, that I could write poems, you know, and, and but, uh, but all those, all those things, or, or playing the violin, which I did, all those things were sort of floating around there, and, and had, were like jigsaw pieces that hadn't come together yet. And what you mentioned is quite interesting, kind of distilling certain thoughts and feelings into this small package. And, mm. and I mean, I, I believe, still believe uh, Temptation of Adam is kind of the perfect short story in a way. Thank but you. Uh, when, when you write these kind of narrative style, um, what is, what is the, how, where do you set out with? Or where do you begin with when you start? Is, do you already have the full story in mind when you start writing? Very rarely. Uh, in fact, I. It's a little, I think about it a little bit like, uh, like excavation, okay. you know, um, like when you find the, 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 the tip of a dinosaur bone and you know there's more under there, you know the whole thing's got to be there, but you got to go away at it with like a brush and like with a little, little shovel and, and you have to be very careful and you suddenly, there's a point at the writing the song when you see, when you know what it is and you know how it's laid out. But when you first start out with a song like Temptation of Adam, the only thing I had when I started was a chord progression and this, if, we ha if, we, if this was a Cold War, we could keep each other warm. That was the only, only line I had. And then from there, I kind of figured out where the song was going. And then suddenly it became a story. And then I would go back and shape it a little bit. But you know, one of the great things about writing is that that, that little circuitous <laughs> adventure takes you to all kinds of places in your head. It's like trying to find your way around Amsterdam when you, when you don't have a map and you're like me right now. You know, you, like, you, 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 you know sort of where you're going, but you, you know you're going to have to take a, a circuitous route to get there, you know? 
Does it have a visual element for you as well? Because when I hear one of those type of songs, I picture it. I have a lot of that with Bob Dylan as well, yeah. where I picture what he's talking about. Yeah. Does it come in visual images for you? Yes, yeah. The visual, it's the story, the, the recitation of the lyrics themselves is almost muscle memory. But the story is like a movie that plays out in my head every time I sing. And that's really what helps me keep track of where I am. You know, is the plot. One thing, uh, you're on album 10 now. Yeah. Uh, written a, a great lot of songs uh, yeah. over the years. Um, but one thing you, you kind of, maybe, I, I don't know if you intentionally shied away from it, but was to, to write an overtly kind of political song. Yeah. Which is what you kind of did uh, on this record. Yeah. So, so what, what changed? Well, there was a couple things. Firstly, I felt like, for whatever, for whatever reason, the catalysts weren't there for me to write about it. The, the, the very issues that struck me at the very moment weren't there that I felt like I had something powerful enough to say. And the last thing I want to do is write a political song just to write one, you know? And I also felt like political songs are very hard to write, you know? They're hard to keep current. They're hard to write a song that will last because they're written about specific political situations and, 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 and those don't age very well. And I like songs that last, you know? And another is that I felt like that, that you know, political songs, either they're written badly or they're written so well that to try and write one yourself is a, is a daunting process, you know? You know, there's, there's, you know, Bob Dylan wrote Hattie Carroll, you know, or Masters of War. You know, there's some songs out there that are, that are you know, are giant whales swimming through the ocean, and all you can do is just admire their power, you know? So to try and write your own was, is, 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 is a little bit, uh, it it's, makes you a little nervous. But, but then what I saw in what is going on in, in America right now is so terrifying, and no one's writing about it. That, you know, if people are writing about it, but, but I felt like it was, it was like, as a writer, my own personal responsibility to talk about it and to, 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 to say what I think is right in the way that I feel like I should say it. I just, it just felt like a, a time, if not now, when, you know? If, 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 the, if, if, if nothing is, if, if, if you can't look around and see a multitude of injustices and, and terrors, then you're not really a writer, you know what I mean? I like what you say about um, kind of not approaching it uh, too specifically because you, in a sense, touch more upon concepts uh, that I feel. And then one example of the Torch Committee is, is you kind of venture into that idea of fear and kind of the uh, diversion of responsibility in, in, in a sense. So, yeah. so, so when, where does a song like that start? Is it just watching the news one day and it just has been nagging you for too long and then you just write about it? Well, the, there was, there was a, a, a two, two sort of separate elements came to me. One had been kind of looming for a while and that was the feeling of the loss of accountability in our culture. And that is, once we lose accountability for our actions, then nobody is held accountable. And it's always, the, the blame is always passed off. And when the blame gets passed off, it always ends up at the bottom of the hill with the poorest and the weakest and the most oppressed, those who can't defend themselves. And when I, I so I had this feeling and I saw, and I, and I saw how the bureaucratic uh, um, kind of wheels of, of our government have been stripping away humanity over time. And in the last couple of years, it's been, uh, it's been increased exponentially. So I had that feeling. And then uh, Charlottesville happened. And, and we saw the, the neo-Nazi rallies. And, and we saw these, these pathetic, weak people carrying torches. And, and the torches were both ominous and also so weak and small as if this little piece of fire could protect you from the darkness that you imagine all around you. But torches are like, are a scary thing, you know, and, and like, and, and the, the idea of a torch committee 
and of a of a of of an uh, authoritarian system that pulls you in and takes away your rights and makes you an accomplice to a horrible situation is what I wanted to write about. And, and so those things kind of came together. The idea of a torch committee being a very insidious and, and dehumanizing organization that, that will suck us all in unless we're careful. I mean, authoritarianism, I don't believe it leaves you with personal choices. You know, it, it makes you choose between your own life and the lives of other people around you. You know, it's, it's, and, and it's a road that we're walking down, and it's a terrifying one, and I wanted to write about it. And then one thing that kind of ties in, uh, one line I wrote down from Awesome Kind of Dream is, um, I thought I knew my, uh, who my neighbor was. It's a good kind of, were you surprised, in, in essence, uh, by kind of this, uh, how this political spectrum has, has kind of, become much more volatile over the years? Yeah, you know, I, I, went, I, was, I went to school. I've, been, I, I've, I've read so much about American history. I've read so much about, you know, just I, I, I thought I knew the contours of some, of some way of American thinking. But I was so wrong. You know, I, I, I didn't fully appreciate. And, and it partly because of the privilege that I've been, I've lived with in my life as a straight white American male, I've never had to confront injustice or oppression or anything like that. Or, and, and, and these last few years have shown me not only how privileged and what a bubble I was living in, but like what a maelstrom and in storm that so many of my fellow American citizens have to live with and fight with every day just to survive. So, and so with the election of Donald Trump, with the, with the rise of this, of this scary populist uh, agenda, uh, it's made me question all, you know, the, just, just people around me and, and like, how, what, is the, what are the limits to our empathy? And like, do we really see each other as human beings? And, and it's funny that I, those, those are questions that I thought in my own foolish way we had, had were mo moving towards settling and moving towards other things. But of course I was wrong and it was a surprise and I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed that it was a surprise. But I, I, I wanted to talk about that in the song. You know? But writing a song about these difficult things and then and, um, does it help in a way make sense of it for yourself? Yeah, it does because uh, because I think you know, like like everybody, I have a, there there are certain things I think I believe, but well, when you sit down and examine them and and you try and make them fit in a in a in a tight space, you start to realize that maybe the the maybe the boat doesn't hold as much water as you think it did, you know, and uh, yeah, it's like. Uh, it helps me to figure things out. It doesn't help me to answer like big questions, but I, I feel that if I am asking questions and I'm examining questions, that's maybe what makes music relatable. You know, is that we're all in a room together listening to music, we're all experiencing the same questions, and maybe that helps us feel less alone. You know, I certainly get that feeling when I listen to other people's music. When I listen to music that I love, I get a sense of camaraderie and a feeling that there are other humans in the world that are thinking like me and have the same questions. You know? I suppose you get to see this on a daily basis when you tour, right? You're kind of seeing that reaction out, yeah. out, out of people and the, the, the collectiveness in, in a way. Well, it's amazing uh, that in, in this moment, uh, you know, when, when we are all so, like, so, uh, so individualized and we all have you know, our own private lives on our phones and, and, and and, and everywhere that and so segmented by so many different forces in society that we can come together, you know, as strangers, you know, in a room and listen to music. That feels like a very powerful human and resistive act and, and a reminder that we are all still like people. Right. There's, there's one uh, last song I want to talk about, which is uh, less looking outwardly, but yeah. I suppose more inwardly, which is uh, losing battles. Yeah. And that's a, that song very is very interesting to me because sort of one it has the the fever breaks line, yeah. line in it, but also it's um, 
you have the line and it's always been in my nature to be the beast so yeah. the kind of acknowledging this this darker side in, in yourself as well kind yeah. of like everybody has that that darker side yeah i'm not sure if i'm interpreting it right yeah. but when you write a song like that well where does your mind go that that song losing battles was was emblematic for me of, of how I wanted to structure the record, which was that there were portions of the record which I wanted to be very explicit, such as Awesome Kind of Dream or the Torch Committee. Mm -hmm. But there are other sections of the record that I, I made my choices based almost on a dream. You know, Fever Breaks, the, the, the very phrase came to me waking up out of my sleep one day, and I didn't know exactly what it meant, but I knew that it was really important to the record. And I don't normally choose titles or anything like that like that way, but that was really important. And, and, and Losing Battles is about, like, is about the, the knowledge that you're imperfect and deeply flawed and that, that you desire friendship and companionship and you're, and you're trying, trying to get better and trying to be better, even though you're wandering through a wilderness of confusing situations. And over, uh, like I mentioned earlier, over the years you've wrote, uh, written quite a lot of songs. Are there still uh, bits of your psyche or, or that you want to explore? I think that it's like, you know, when, when I get done with a record, I always think, well, that's it. You know, like, I, I, don't, I don't know what I'm going to do now. You know, I'm going to have to start doing something else because I have nothing else that... But then, you know, a, a phrase jumps into your head or you read a book or you're, you're out walking or you hear a, a bit of music. And, and, and a you know, key turns in the latch, and then suddenly you're in a whole new room in your mind. And um, I have stopped being nervous about the fact that I don't know where that key is going to come from. I know it'll, it'll show up somewhere. And uh, it's just about like, kind of being open to that and, and following when it happens. But that's an interesting thought. Were you ever worried that you couldn't write the song anymore? Always. Yeah. You know, and always, like, always. Sometimes in the middle of songs, you know, okay. because, you know, sometimes you'll spend three hours trying to write something and you have nothing. And then somebody asks you what you did with your day and you have to lie about it, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, you, because, like, you, some, most of the time you're working and you don't get anything. And then, mm. and then on, on that occasion, you know, somebody throws you the perfect pitch and you hit the ball mm. and it goes forever, you know, mm. and you live for those moments, you know. But I do think, because as I saw some pictures on, I think it was Instagram, where you have those uh, kind of how you write songs and a lot of scribbled yeah. uh, things. So, so it, it is definitely a craft, I think, yeah. because, because I hear two kind of sides. So either it's a craft or you just wait for divine inspiration. But for you, it's, it's very much a craft, right? It's a craft, for sure. Like, there's, there's, there's the immediate idea you know, that it comes to you. But it's, you know, the immediate idea, idea is, not, is not always, like, it, it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing, but it's, not, it's an uncut. It's uncut jewel, you know. You have to really spend time and work at, work at getting the idea fully right so that the idea can actually shine. And, you know, a song half-formed can be okay, but it could be beautiful, you know. And uh, every little song deserves that chance, you know. And sometimes you just work and work and the song is not that good. But maybe there's a little bit of it, and you keep that little bit, and eventually it will make it into another song. So, know? do you still have a graveyard of all the kind of the fallen songs? Oh, I have so many. Yeah, <laughs> I have an idea that I want to go and just sit down and record like at least these sixty ideas that I have, and just get them out of my head so I can start over. So you can go and go to the uh, yeah, you can move yeah, on and exactly over. yeah. All right, Josh, thank you very much for your time. Oh, thank you thank so you. much. Thank you so right. much. Thank you.